Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to another episode of the Diversion Stars podcast, third season. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. And remember, click that subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Jim Zub returns to the mothership. You know him as the writer of Conan the Barbarian from Titan Comics. Now come on board as we go traversing the stars. Hi, Mr. Zub. Thank you so much for coming back to the Diversion Stars podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. It's totally my pleasure. So I'm gonna start off with um so the last time we spoke, we we um you voiced your love for Conan the um, the Barbarian. I, I remember yeah. you specifically saying that you love the character. Now you're writing him for Titan Comics. That's um right. so has writing him reached your expectations? Uh it's been a real joy. I mean, I've written Conan the Barbarian before at other publishers, but the chance to do kind of this big uh relaunch initiative and to to introduce the character to a whole bunch of new readers has been a really cool and unique opportunity and uh, the success we've seen with the launch that we had last summer has been uh, has been amazing it's been really really cool it's been a lot of fun so when we think about the character what has surprised you the most about writing for him now um i think the i don't know about surprise it's like the longevity of a character like that the iconic nature of them makes it always both a challenge and kind of a an honor like a joy it there's there are so many people who have read, you know, Conan the Barbarian stories from the original Robert E. Howard prose novels to the comic books, you know, the classic stuff by Roy Thomas through to a more modern era. And um, it really does feel generational. And when you get to meet those readers and they have a lot of passion for that character, you kind of realize the responsibility of what you're taking on, that you are trying to keep up, you know, a tradition that, that, carries alongside that character and then propel it to hopefully new readers and to returning readers and make something that pleases both you kind of creatively, but also them in a way that keeps their, you know, kind of fan fire burning, you know, strong. Yeah. You know, you know, I didn't realize until I was doing a little bit of research to prepare for the interview. Conan O'Brien, uh, Conan O'Brien, sorry, Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> well, Conan okay. O'Brien also has a long publishing, like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, I've been I've been up more or less since 5.30 in the morning, so I just got to yeah, bear with me just a little bit. He, um, he's been published since 1932, That's which right. beat Superman by six years, yes. so this is a character that's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about a character that is closing in on 100 years of existing, how like, what do you think defines conan i mean is he's right better... that why why is this character stuck around you know kind of right i i think the reality is like like a superman the character has become the icon the template of the genre in a lot of ways robert e howard pioneered the sword and sorcery genre like within the scope of fantasy or within it's not you know historical kind of fantasy and it's not high magical fantasy sword and sorcery is kind of its own beast and a lot of that builds off of the foundation of, of robert e howard and specifically uh his sensibilities and the pulp kind of sensibilities that define conan and and that weird tales and a bunch of these other pulp magazines from that period there were dozens and dozens of authors, but only a few of them have kind of stuck around in the public consciousness. And Robert E. Howard and Conan in particular are, are core to that. And I think it's because it taps into something very fundamental, this idea of, you know, kind of survival in the unknown, these big broad themes that he brings into a lot of the stories about civilization versus savagery. And that the civilized world is not necessarily the better one, uh -huh. but that the savage world also carries with it all kinds of, of danger and difficulty. And that, you know, life is a struggle and that these this character in particular is about resisting kind of those elements that that conan is a survivor he adapts to all kinds of different environments and all kinds of different things he travels forth and he discovers things about himself but just as much as that he is pushing out into the unknown and by his very nature where he goes things will transform and things will change until ultimately you know he becomes a king by his own hand and that's sort of the ultimate expression of that sort of change and transformation and survival and so it's a 
in a lot of ways, it is a classic kind of template because it set that template. And every time, if you say the word barbarian, Conan is the first thing that everyone thinks of. And if they're not thinking of that character in particular, they're either playing off of those tropes or they're playing against those tropes. Oh. That's the thing about an icon, right? If you make a superhero and you make distinct choices, you're making those choices in comparison to Superman. Oh. When you make fantasy choices about sword and sorcery and that singular hero, they're in comparison to Conan. And that is, that's a very powerful thing. That's a very cool, fundamental kind of character in literature that you the ability to write that character and hopefully make your mark with is uh, is really special. And I certainly don't take that for granted. And, and when you think about the iteration of the character, um, re most recently, um, before your run, he was a mm -hmm. basically a Marvel superhero character, more or less Savage Avengers. He was public. He was published by Marvel and they decided that they would have him in the Marvel continuity. Right. But there was also, you know, th they had, series where he's running around the Marvel universe with superheroic characters, but they also have, you know, some classic kind of fantasy stuff in the mix as well. Yeah. And it, and you also have Arnold Schwarzenegger's famous portrayal of, of course, uh, in the movie. So when you're thinking about your voice or which to pull from, which right. elements are you pulling out and saying, I'm going to take from these interpretations sure. and make him mine? I mean, the reality is everything builds off the foundation of the prose stories, right? The original prose stories by Robert E. Howard, the, the vast majority of which are short stories, those provide the purest kind of distillation of the concept. And obviously, we're deeply influenced by other things that came later in the sense that the artistic style of someone like Frank Frazetta or John Buscema or Barry Windsor Smith, they become part of that primordial kind of material that you that you build upon or that visually people attribute to they're, they're the same visual touches that influence the movie production the reason why they cast arnold schwarzenegger is because he looked like the character from the frazetta covers from the comic books at that time and so of course they all kind of feed into each other visually we want to imbue it with that iconic um, look of the character because that's what people expect to see mm. but you're also trying to bring like you said your own voice into it you're trying to use what we've got in terms of modern publishing and our ability to say you know we're not limited by the comics code authority right, right. so in terms of content we can actually go closer to the original pulp kind of sensibilities a little more violent a little more sexual a little more intense in that kind of way and deliver something that hopefully feels like that kind of original material writ large in a modern sense you know and then on top of that you've got um just my own kind of sensibilities around mythic storytelling and trying to tell stories that are both easy to jump into and a reader can just sort of get a cool adventure yarn out of it but that over time if you keep reading you see that we're layering in bigger kind of movements in the world or in the mythic structure or in the kind of um you know, the stakes of the thing will keep rising and building over a longer period of time. And that's what's really cool about having the ability to to write the character over a longer span is that I can do the immediate entertainment issue by issue or arc by arc, and then know that in a couple of years, as we're paying off these things, we can layer in, you know, cooler kind of uh, of stories and, and wheels within wheels, if you will. And and the cool thing with um, Conan, uh, Conan, Conan, Conan. I, I'm probably gonna get the. Uh, it's all good. Some people say. Some people say Conan. Some people say Conan. It. Uh, it it's not that big. Same thing with you know, uh, uh, a lot of the pronunciation on on some of the names. It sort of depends on where you're from. It depends on on your background as well. So I I don't quibble over that stuff too hard. Don't worry about it. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, no worries. So, so one thing as as well as that. Once again, you have um, Conan the icon. But yeah. sometimes you need to write Conan the, as an actual living individual, a person. Right. He, he has right. to feel like he does exist. So well, and, and and that he that he can be. Yes, he's the hero of our story. So there's that sense of he's going to win in the end. But you have to make the stakes high enough and the risks feel real enough that there's doubt that the reader is not just going to be like, well, he's invulnerable, he's unstoppable. He isn't really super heroic in that kind of way, 
you know, he is impressively, you know, potent and he is very skilled and you put him up against some crazy odds, but there's this sense of he can be injured. He can be brought low. He can be, you know, knocked out and, and maimed and all that kind of stuff. And so it's, it's where and when you kind of pull those levers. Right. So how in the story do you weave in his humanity? I think it's the fact that he is in in the way particular that we're doing it in the in the new series the wanderlust that he has most sumerians stay kind of where they were born they're going to live their entire lives within samaria they live under those gloomy skies and they have their barbaric tribes and they defend what's theirs but they not they're not curious they don't want to see beyond those borders and they don't believe that they should have to or that that you know if there's danger out there, stay, stay home, defend what's yours and, you know, um, live your life and fight and survive. But that's the extent of it is kind of the edges of their borders. And Conan is one of the few Sumerians who's, who travels forth and sees more and does more. Uh -huh. And so his wanderlust and his curiosity and his, his ability to learn and to grow in terms of expanding his vision expanding his knowledge eventually in the pulps he learns more languages and he begins to appreciate cultures that his ancestor told him weren't worth a damn mm. that they that that individual people are not necessarily you know the broad brushstroke of their culture or a stereotype or a cliche and you know there are monsters and there is death and there is danger and there's dark magic and gods and all that kind of stuff but you over the course of his travels he <laughs> learns both you know the value of other people and the ability to lead and motivate kind of other people and as i said you know he ends up becoming a king by his own hand because of his guile because of his intelligence and because of um his ability to to evolve as a character and that's really the key there is when you're writing that story you have to know kind of where he is along that longer timeline and what kind of a man he is, you know, is this the young Conan who's sort of like sowing his oats and testing his limits? Or is this the Conan who's later in his career? He's a veteran of a ton of battles, but he's starting to become a leader of men and someone who understands nuance, if if that can be believed, you know? So. Well, the, the thing that's interesting as well about him is that, given that, he, like I said, we published 1932, um, given mm -hmm. that he has this long history, given that he's had a long history with other companies that um, you can often, so at times, no longer use some of the material, what do you then exist in canon for your storyline? So the only thing that's absolute canon are the original 21 Robert E. Howard stories. Those are the pillars of a timeline. Those are the things that define the character's history. And the only, for lack of a better term, facts that we kind of work with. Um, Heroic Signatures, which is the rights holders to Conan the Barbarian and the Robert E. Howard Library, they have rights to reprint all the Marvel stuff, any of the other comics from Dark Horse or other places the character's been published. So in theory, you can use all that stuff. In theory, you could use stuff from the movies or, or even the animated TV show or stuff like that. But rather than trying to make a garbled mess of all of it, our, what we're trying to do is sort of go, okay, the Robert E. Howard stories are canon. Those are the absolutes. Our stories can fit in between those or, or help expand upon some of those. And if we want to use a character or an item or a creature from one of those classic other comic stories or from another novel or from the movies, if we decide we want to use some of that, it's more like, I wouldn't say an Easter egg, but it's it's like a fun thing to do rather than an absolute continuity, if that yeah. makes sense. It's like a like a a nod to the past and kind of going, isn't that cool? Remember that thing? Remember that was kind of fun? This is part of our new kind of uh, you know ongoing story, or or that's something that we can kind of bring into the mix rather than it feeling like we have to use all of it or discard all of it, you know. So theoretically, he could make a reference to Spider-Man because he technically still have. Well, no, it's it, it, like the the actual superhero stuff. I wouldn't. It wouldn't play well to have the character referencing what adventures in New York City in the modern age. You know, that's that's kind of off the table because it it breaks certain fundamental aspects of the character hmm. and their history. If if he knows that in the future there's going to be cars and spaceships and planes and stuff, 
it it diffuses and deflates the power of the era that he lives in. Do you know mm. what I mean? It makes it feel small. And so you've always got to kind of look at what is what is important in terms of the story you're trying to tell and what is the the what is at the heart of, like you sort of said, the character. And those kind of superhero crossovers are not fundamental to the character. They were like a fun game that that you know Marvel was playing in order to boost up Conan's uh kind of visibility and in order to boost the visibility of the other characters in those crossover kind of books. That's huh. like it's like the what if stories or anything else. They're they're fun, playful kind of bits and they're fun experiments, but they're outside of the core kind of history and the ongoing sort of epic that's being told in the same way that if we brought in other Robert E. Howard characters for a crossover, by the end of it, it Conan doesn't have a machine gun in the Hyborian age. He's not going to be running around and doing stuff that feels intrinsically um, at odds with the era and with the character. Otherwise you kind of, you strip what makes it special and makes it feel, you know, pure out of it. So currently in the storyline, he teamed up with a group called the Glory Hounds. Yes. Uh, yeah. He's... So um, for the readers, what does Conan feel like he owes? Does he feel he owes them anything? Are they being used for a particular purpose? Um, I mean, this particular story takes place after one of the uh, canon prose stories. So Conan has just, and we allude to that with the flashbacks and things like that, that the Queen of the Black Coast, which is a very... Um, potent story it's one of the best in the kind of conan canon you know conan be ends up on a pirate ship with this pirate queen named belit and she and conan are deeply in love with each other and they're like going to grab the world by the throat and they're going to take what they want and she is so ambitious and so intense and so fervent that it leads to her kind of th this tragic demise and so i hadn't ever really seen stories that show the depth of kind of Conan's despair in terms of losing that stuff. And so I wanted to put him in a place where he had lost everything and he had kind of bottomed out. Uh -huh. And when he goes to Shadazar and he joins with the glory hounds, they want a muscle. They want muscle. They want a bodyguard. They want someone who can kick ass, you know, and, and when things go wrong on one of their heists and he's more than willing to indulge that for enough coin, basically to drink himself into oblivion. <laughs> And so that's kind of the key is he is in a terrible self-destructive place. He doesn't care about himself. He cares about others in that broad sense of like, he still has the fundamental honorable quality of, I promised you I would do a job or I promised you I would do a thing. So I'll do a thing. But if that includes killing people or, or, you know, rape, wrecking his own reputation or something like that, that's totally on the table. He will kill and destroy he is the thief but like with none of that i wouldn't say no goodness but like there's a real darkness that's taken hold of his heart and so he will rage and and take that out on other people and other things around him you give him a target he'll shatter it because that's a way for him to get those sort of negative uh impulses out for the moment and then it's give me my coin i've done my job you know, back to the tavern kind of stuff. And so there's a tragic quality that echoes the tragedy of the Queen of the Black Coast story and the ripple effect that it has, that sort of aftermath of this terrible event and how it it's haunting him, both metaphorically and also, as you'll see in the story, literally, you know, spiritually and, and kind of to his very core. And so in that way, we get to have this destruction and this intensity and this violence, but it's not like mindless it's with purpose and it's this um exploration of conan as a tragic figure so um thinking about his adventures with the glory hounds how much of it is running towards a future or how much is it, is it running away from what happened in the past with belit and everything else I, I think it's both i think he's i think he's trying to purge that stuff from his mind but it haunts him i think in some ways he doesn't, he isn't planning for the future. He's very much in the moment and he's trying to um, just subsist. He, he the, the intrinsic survivalist that's inside him won't let him destroy himself fully, but he's certainly going to damage himself constantly, if that sort of makes sense. And, and like I said, it's a tragic kind of a figure. He's, uh, you know, 
we may know as readers that he has many more adventures to come, but in that moment, he doesn't think he does. And so he kind of is going to have to rediscover his, his wanderlust or his desire to see more and be more, you know? So, so the, the, the Conan that lives within the series, would you say is he is not then what we would understand as the heroic Conan? I think in this moment, I think if you reread the original stories, he's not he's not always a heroic figure. Sometimes he is very much a mercenary. He is honorable in the sense he will tell you what he's doing and why, and he will not he will never stab you in the back. He's going to tell you, if you cross me, I will take you down. You know what I mean? That's the thing about that civilization versus savagery. In the civilized world, they're nice to your face and they stab you in the back. Mm -hmm. A barbarian in the Hyborian age will never stab you in the back. He tells it to you straight. If you cross me, if you go over this line, if you do this thing I told you not to do, you will die by my hands. Is that a better way to go? You know, is that more true? Is that more... Is that more real? Is that more honorable? Is that more forthright? He's still a killer, but it's this fascinating thing where it's like, you know, at the start of, of Queen of the Black Coast, in that original story, Conan basically, um, one of his friends is, is the guards are trying to find him. They run away, they arrest Conan, and they basically say, tell us where this guy is or we'll throw you in jail. And he basically says, I'm not going to rat out my friend you know, find him yourself. And they're like, oh, so you admit that you know where he is. And he basically goes, oh, this is like a kangaroo court. And he just breaks out of the court and he runs for it because he, you know, he, he knows that these legal systems and this kind of bureaucracy that he's trapped in is meant to, to entrap you. It's meant to, you know, make you dishonorable and make you something that you're not. And so he's just going to break the system and go. And that's very much in line with both Conan and the character and Robert E. Howard, the author, you know, he was this Texan who was in a part of the country where that self-defining kind of nature and spirit and what is what is the right thing to do and what is it to be a rugged kind of individualist. And so you want to reflect those kinds of qualities while still putting the character into hopefully unexpected circumstances and, and new kind of uh, threats and challenges, you know? Well, the, the interesting thing we're talking about um, his from point of view of morality, in the mm -hmm. world of Conan, the gods are real. It, 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 it not, right. They're not just real, but it's not like if if you are someone of faith, you would say the gods are real. He knows for a fact right. they're they're real. You can literally interact with them at some level. But these gods aren't, let's say, Judeo -Christ Christian. They're not even necessarily right. even like Greek. They are not necessarily moral or even care about morality in, in their own perspective i think so, in that way they are more like the Ro roman and greek gods where they're like they can be petty they can be vengeful they're playing out their own dramatic play of power on a on a higher plane of yeah. of whatever you want to call it power if you want to say that right they are the movements of gods and deities and demons is happening whether or not the people of the Hyborian age can do anything about it. And sometimes they may come under the purview of those gods, but usually they are just a part of their war, either as pawns or as just victims. And I think that the mysterious quality of that and Conan's ability to survive in the face of that defines both the Hyborian age and himself as well. That it's, it's not, even if we as the reader glimpse more of the big play, Conan is surviving in the moment and his decisions are made based on like the knowledge that he has in front of him. What, you know, kill the wizard, destroy the monster, you know, get the gold, get the, get the hell out of there kind of stuff. And I think that that, um, there's a simplicity to it, but it's also kind of a fun aspect to it. He doesn't need to know the nuance. He's not there for, millennia of conflict between you know deities and powers and elder gods he's the fly in the ointment to their plans they think that they know how it's all going to play out and then this one damn barbarian can sort of turn the tide or or tip the apple cart on them you know i think it's kind of a fascinating idea is that what is also about going that he live in a world of gods and he doesn't have a fear of them it doesn't seem like 
I mean, he's afraid of magic in the sense that magic in the Hyborian age is mysterious and unknowable and almost always carries with it horrific costs. He's not, he's not stupid. He's not like going to court disaster purposefully, mm. but he does what he must. If, if someone's going to try and mess him up with it, he'll also, he knows, you know, uh, a, a sword is a pretty powerful incantation stopper. You know what I mean? Mm. And so it's like, he's he's not going to go out of his way to piss the gods off let's put it that way he's not necessarily going to purposefully um decimate and 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 call them down upon him but he also knows that he's got to do what needs to be done to survive and i think that that's what's really kind of interesting in that broader sense he's not like petty petty blasphemous but on the other hand he's certainly not afraid in the grand scheme of things, because he also knows that if he dies in grand battle and he does it with courage, then, you know, he'll stand before Krom and maybe Krom will acknowledge him or maybe the God of the mountain will ignore him like he ignores everything else. But at least he'll have done what a Sumerian is supposed to do, you know, fight to his last breath. Well, uh, and the current card um, storyline has him um, trying to capture an important artifact that is related to the gods. Right. So how does does that connect at all to what's going on with his feelings of loss about Billy? Um, yeah, but I can't really tip my hand. <laughs> <laughs> it does tie into it in broader structures, and it ties into our first story arc as well, called Bound in Black Stone. And that's part of that bigger, longer mythic play that we're putting together, that each individual story, so Thrice Marked for Death, which is our second story, you can just read it as a self-contained, cool-ass adventure, or you can start to see these things layering up from the previous storyline and on to the next one. The third story arc that we've announced the name of, at least, called The Age Unconquered, it um, it kind of plays the potential of those first two story arcs and galvanizes them in a way that I built it so that if we only got 12 issues, that you would get a crazy, epic, badass story. And I'm mm. thankful that the book launched really strong and we're going to go much longer than those 12, but you just don't know in the modern kind of publishing market, what you're going to get. And so I was like, well, we're not going to hold anything back. The first 12 are going to be as big and as crazy and as intense as we can deliver so that we can prove to the readership, the existing readership, the lapsed fan base, and hopefully, you know, a lot of new fans that Conan is well worth their time and has earned their cover price, you know, every single month. Right. And 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 thankfully that's what's happening. We've gotten sellouts on every single issue so far. We've gotten probably the best reviews of my career, a lot of excitement from uh, older readers. You know, I was talking about that generational aspect and they're digging in on the books and they're enjoying it and they're sharing it with others. And uh, it's a really exciting time. It's an exciting time for me as a, as a writer and for all of us on the publishing team. You know, the artists that we have working on the series, Rob Zolatore and Doug Braithwaite, you know, Dean White and Diego Rodriguez, our colorists, Richard Starkings and, and you know, Chris and Jay and, and Ashley and everyone on the editorial team. Like we are so focused and pumped on making the best damn book that we can. And we're putting our passion into it and the readership is responding in kind. And I could not be more, you know, kind of proud. Well, I mean, that's one of the things with um, Conan. I mean, the only the series only the writing grade. The art is terrific. Thank and you. from a visual standpoint, you are competing with Frank Frazetta. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> well, that's uh, the thing, right? You are building on, you. we stand on the shoulders of giants. Like, right. like some of the, Savage Sword of Conan was the first gig for so many seminal artists in comics and in fantasy illustration. It was, it was a testing ground and it was a showcase for so much phenomenal talent. And that is the legacy of the character. And that's the publishing legacy in the comics. And so for us to do right by that means bringing that level of quality, that level of heat, that level of, of verse and poetry and intensity and pulp and, and uh, you know, trying not to compromise on any aspect of that. And that's a, it's a tall order for anybody. And, and, I feel that pressure in a good way. I feel that stress and that excitement about how can we up the ante and excite and surprise readers month to month to month, but still work with the ingredients that feel very classic and intrinsic to what makes Conan great. 
And I think another thing um, that's interesting is um, so the issue six is what's out is is the newest issue mm -hmm. that that that, that I, I know of. Mm -hmm. Issue six. Uh, there's a surprise twist at the end without giving away too many spoilers oh, with uh, Chandra. Right. Um, so, but there seems to be a suggestion that there's a, a similar twist coming with Conan. Um, what, what can you tease about upcoming issues? I mean, we're we're definitely setting the table for a dark. It is a tragic story. We built this tragic interplay between the characters, this tragic intensity in terms of, of Conan's desire for self-destruction. And we're going to play that to the hilt. I will say that like issue eight feels more like a horror movie than your typical kind of fantasy fair. It is absolutely harrowing, violent, intense, and full of surprises that I cannot wait for people to read. And when Doug started drawing it, I compared it and I said, we want this to feel like, like a relentless, you know, the, the equivalent of like Jason Voorhees, like, like a character coming and hunting relentlessly and unstoppable. And how do we mm -hmm. imbue, you know, horror is an intrinsic part of pulp fantasy and of dark fantasy and of uh, sword and sorcery and so i was like let's tune those elements up let's really push them to the limit and and excite and surprise the readership with how kind of dark we can go and how intense we can pay off the emotional quality of conan's despair and uh the places that we're going to push him like i said you guys are doing a, a great job with the series and, and i'm enjoying it and like i said it's well done well, well written the art is incredible and I think you. Uh, I look forward to seeing what you guys do next. Thank you. It's a, it's an honest pleasure. Like I've been hearing from so many readers that they they're picking up the book. A lot of people are starting pull files at their comic book shops that they haven't had in years. And you know, we've had a couple issues delayed in terms of shipping. And I know this sounds weird, but like one of the best compliments I get is if you know we announce a delay and I get angry social media like. If you are waiting for it with intensity and you don't get it uh, and you're angry about that, that means you want more. You can't wait. You're not just going to come pick it up, you know, in a couple months when it piles up in your backlist or eventually you'll remember, oh, right, I have a pull at the comic store. You are like day and date. You want that damn thing because you can't wait to see what's coming next. That is a, you know, that's a positive sign. Obviously, I want a book to come out on time, but <laughs> but that idea that, you know, People want this thing and we've got something that they're excited about. That's, um, you know, that's a vote of confidence as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Well, Mr. Rizzo, it's been an absolute honor to talk with you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much. And thank you for reading. Have a fantastic night, sir. You too. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Diversing Stars podcast. Please help me battle those algorithms by liking and subscribing. Be sure to return for the next episode when we are visited by Carissa Grant.